The following program is presented by the Hospice Foundation of America and underwritten by the John and Juana Harmon Foundation. Hello, I'm Frank Sesno. Ahead, stories that will move you, inspire you, and prompt a conversation we desperately need to have about death and life. For many, the very word hospice evokes a strong reaction. Whether it is comfort or fear depends on whom you ask. Some think it means giving up. But those who are familiar with this special kind of medical care know hospice is more about living than dying and making every day count. Welcome to Hospice, Something More. In this program, we'll explain what hospice is and is not. These are the stories of actual hospice patients, families, and caregivers. We'll hear from them and we'll talk to them. We'll experience why hospice is something more. It's a brilliant Saturday morning and a youth football scrimmage is just getting underway. On the sideline, 44-year-old Karen Jones stands watching her son Michael. She's joined by her husband Bill and her younger son Mitchell, as well as a nanny and a good friend. If it weren't for the oxygen tube she's wearing, you'd never know that Karen was ill, much less that she has stage four lung cancer. And you'd never realize that this is Karen Jones in hospice. I mean, I thought, my gosh, I mean, that's the end. Like, I'll go into some bed in some facility and, you know, that'll be it. And it's been completely different and it's been so helpful. Karen and Bill met in the early 1990s while working together for the government. And it was one of those deals where you met this beautiful girl and she was talented and hardworking and I fell in love with her right from the start. There was a spark there that was uh, very cute actually. I made dinner and um, he did the dishes. So I was like, wow, <laughs> you know, that would be a good catch. They married in 1996 two sons soon followed. Life was good. And then about three years ago, while she was training up for a marathon, Karen started to have problems breathing. When I was running, I get, I, you know, just couldn't breathe. And they treated her for a variety of different illnesses. I was told, you know, I had sinusitis. Acid reflux. I also got strep throat twice, which I never got from the kids, ever. One thing led to another, and, uh, she was finally able to uh, run the marathon and with some steroids to help with her breathing, she finished the marathon. I was so happy to have finished it. And then here it comes where now I can't breathe when I'm laying down. We ended up going over to the emergency room and they took an x-ray and said, well, she can't breathe because her chest is full of fluids. It was Ash Wednesday, I'll never forget it. Um, and they drained three liters off my right lung. So that's what it was, pushing up when I was running. Karen had finished running her first marathon with stage four lung cancer. When Karen was first diagnosed, she was in the hospital, I was at home. So she was alone when I came in and told her. He came in, got in a chair, moved her close, and goes, well, we got the test back, and it's cancer. And you know, it was, Pretty devastating. I told him and he broke down. I got through the visit and, and went home and I came. Came to the house and I put the boys to bed. I went out in the backyard and threw myself on the ground and prayed. And I was telling him, I'm like, we're going to do everything we can you know, to really try to beat this and seek out and put everything in God's hands. And try they did, from the NIH in Bethesda to Sloan Kettering in New York to Mass General in Boston and Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Karen went through one chemotherapy regimen after another, but her cancer was a rare form and there was no protocol for treating it. Chemo might work for a few months, but the cancer always returned. 
I mean, you get tired, like it, it's poison. These toxins that are going into your body, you know, they could kill you sometimes instead of making you better. After almost three years of grueling treatments, Karen had run out of options. Her cancer was terminal. And we finally came to that unfortunate time where the doctor said, there's nothing more that we can do for you. You know, we can't treat this cancer. There's no effective treatment. Your body is not able to continue to take these treatments because they, they, they impact your system. I was told, look, um, you know, we don't have anything else for you. Um, may want to try hospice and just, you know, think about how you want to live your life. And I just kind of looked at him and I'm like, okay. Uh, I didn't want to do hospice. I was scared of it immensely. When the idea first came up, Karen was very against it. And I've tried to be supportive. And so I, you know, if you don't want hospice, you don't want hospice. Karen returned home. She wasn't doing well. When she came out of that hospital stay, she was really worn down and tired and suffering from the symptoms that this disease has brought on, you know, significant symptoms. I had swelling in my legs and I had difficulty walking because it was so much swelling. But what happened was I started to get fatigued. You know, I'm trying to work a full-time job, trying to take care of the kids, participate in their activities, trying to take care of my wife who was still in a recovery mode and needed, you know, medicine every two hours or every four hours, needed help with, you know, activities to just function during the day. And it very soon became apparent to me that despite my best efforts, I wasn't going to be able to keep up and I, I was failing. So I was going to the bathroom or trying to get to the bathroom and I fell and hit the door. One day the priest was visiting, we were up talking to her while she was in bed and she was in the no hospice mode and I started to cry and I said, then you're going to have to go somewhere because I can't take care of you. If you won't accept the help, then I'm, I'm done. And I had never said that, you know, ever, but it was there, I'd reached my limit. And that's when Bill's like, that's enough, you know. We don't look at hospice as a bad thing. I need help, you need help. She looked at me and realized that I was, you know, very serious and, and she said, okay, well, let's try them. But we won't call them hospice. We'll call them personal care people. I said, okay. So we called the personal care people and they came out. One of those people is Dr. Hank Wilner. Chief Medical Officer of Holy Cross Hospice. He's part of a team of caregivers that also includes a nurse, a social worker, grief counselors, and a home health aide. Hi, Karen. Hi, Dr. Wilder. How are you doing? Great to see you. Yeah, I'm nice well. You. I'm well, thank you. Like your tie. Thank you very much. You look terrific. Thank you. Feeling and good. And if it weren't for the oxygen, <laughs> nobody would know you were sick. They would know. I know. It's really. great. It's really great. It's been over a month since Dr. Wilner first started seeing Karen. She was virtually bedridden when I met her uh, in a moderate amount of pain uh, with a lot of fluid retention. Hospice is meant for people whose life expectancy is six months or less. The goal of the hospice team was to relieve Karen's pain and treat her symptoms. The effect was dramatic. It was night and day. You could see her just right away start to do better. She got on different medicines, the swelling and some of these symptomatic problems she had started to clear up. She felt better, she had more energy, and it was just this beautiful progression. Through adjusting her medications and encouragement and allowing her to follow her own instincts, she has now amazingly become ambulatory with oxygen. She's uh, driving her car. Uh, she's contemplating uh, walking in a 10K road race because she was a marathoner. And she has regained a level of function that's just amazing. And she's remained confident, positive, and upbeat through it all. In hospice, treatment comes to Karen, 
allowing her to conserve energy for herself and her family. Well, hospice, I was like, you go somewhere to go to hospice to die. I never thought of them coming into your house to help you. So it was very actually convenient to have the nurse's aide come, to have the nurse come to you, to have the doctor come to you. I mean, it was incredibly helpful. Blood pressure 100 over 70, uh, temperature 97.8, respirations a tad bit high. Okay. But the beauty of hospice is that it provides us with the resources we need to live our lives here at home. And the benefit to that is that my wife is able to be here every day to interact with the kids, to interact with me, to take on the activities that she wants to take on. And hospice with the doctors and the nurses and the, the caregivers during the day and if you need them at night, put you in a position, put the patient in a position to maximize whatever energy level they have. And it tends to have a positive impact on the patient. It does give you hope when you feel better. And when you have the help that you need and the support and makes your life easier, it, uh, it brings you comfort to know that you have those services there to really help you. It's getting tremendously better as far as my mobility. Dr. Wellner gave me permission to drive short distances, which was incredible. I was so happy I could go to 910 Mass in the morning, go to the market, take the kids on an errand if they needed. I took a walk last week with my husband. I had the portable oxygen, um, but we walked down the street, and I'm going to continue to do that. So that gives me a lot of satisfaction and happiness. Really? Is that a daddy story? Hospice care isn't going to cure Karen's cancer, but it will give her the best possible quality of life in the time she has remaining. We've seen Karen make strides that they never would have projected, but I can tell you every day to see her improve, to see able to participate in the activities with the boys, to be able to interact with my wife, I mean, it's priceless. And joining me now is Samara Beckwith, President and CEO of Hope Healthcare Services based in Fort Myers, Florida. Samara, priceless is the word he used. What an incredible story of hope and perseverance and courage. We should say there is no cure for the cancer she's got, and we all understand that. But the idea of feeling better with hospice care, is that a common experience, and how's that happen? It really is very common. In fact, what we have found is that people live better their remaining days, whether it be weeks, months, maybe even a year. Actually, many people do live longer because they do have hospice care now. So it's the care that hospice is delivering that makes that happen? It really is the care because when we relieve pain and symptoms and improve the quality of life, many people do live longer. We heard Karen say something a moment ago which I thought was really fascinating. Her initial impression of hospice was that it was a bed, it was a facility, the implication a place to go to die. You're saying something very different. Absolutely. In fact, the vast majority of hospice care is actually provided in a person's home or maybe their family member's home. And that is because people want to be at home for as long as possible. And the hospice team, the medical equipment, the supplies, the medication can all be provided in the home. And that's what makes hospice very special. So why do people fear hospice? People believe that when you accept hospice care, that means that you have days or maybe only weeks left to live, that it's about dying. However, hospice care is really about living as fully as possible every day that you have remaining and to help have more quality of life in every single day, to look at what we can do. Do you want to go to your son's uh, football game? Those kinds of things. We can't cure your illness. We can't cure the disease. And However, you're not there to do that. You're not there to be, you're not curative. You're not. No, we're not curative. However, we're about care and comfort and quality. So, Samara, when, when in the course of an illness should someone go into hospice? Well, usually earlier than they do. Really? Absolutely. So people, you think people wait too long? People they could be getting more out of it earlier? Mm -hmm. How early? Yes. How do they well, know? Well, 
when the illness, when there's a very good chance that the illness won't be cured and the fact that the person needs help with pain and symptoms and maybe even talking to the children, that's the time to at least talk to hospice about what's available and how they can help. So Mara, who, who pays for this? Hospice is covered by Medicare, Medicaid, and because it really does make a difference for people in terms of quality of life and quality of care, most insurance companies now cover hospice care. So this is not something that most people are going to have to dig deep into their pockets to pay for personally? No. It actually is an opportunity to relieve the financial burden because hospice is now covering medication, supplies, equipment, the staff coming out to the house. And that's why it's even more important that they have hospice care earlier than later. Thanks, Samara. We'll talk to you again later in the program. Thank you. Well, selecting hospice care is a big decision for patients and their families, but it isn't the only decision they're likely to face. For one thing, once someone is in hospice, they often face choices they didn't expect about what they want to do in their remaining time, whether additional medical treatments are appropriate, and even whether to leave hospice care to pursue a clinical trial. Some patients actually get discharged if their condition stabilizes or improves. Let's meet several patients now and their families who've been grappling with these issues. In the suburbs of Washington, D.C., Michael Smith and his wife, Nancy, were living a happy life. We met um, at American University our, our freshman year. We're college sweethearts, dated through college and got married in 1984. It was very nice because when you marry somebody who's really your best friend, we just had a really fun time. They started a family, a daughter, Rachel, and twin sons, David and Will. In 2006, that spring and summer, Michael knew something wasn't right, and they couldn't find it and couldn't find it. And finally, finally, they found the tumor, uh, which was diagnosed as colorectal cancer. Um, he was 45 at the time. The twins were in seventh grade. Rachel was a senior in high school. Michael began treatment, radiation, surgery, then chemotherapy. The family hoped for the best, but after a year and a half, the cancer returned. And the chemo started again, um, everything started up again. And at some point, he, uh, he was done. Um, he wasn't done living, but the chemo wasn't giving the results they wanted. Um, you know, they were trying a lot of things and nothing was changing it, but it was kind of ruining his quality of life. And so he decided to stop and kind of go to palliative care. So hospice came into our lives. Michael decided to focus on getting the most out of his remaining days. His doctor helped him realize what counted. She was really, really helpful in judging quality of life and really was the person who worked hard to get him to stop working. Sorry. And uh, she was the one who really worked on him about the time he had left and how to use that and what did that energy need to go for and was work where that energy needed to go. Michael saved what little energy he had for his bucket list, things he wanted to do for his family. When my dad was sick, he, uh, he set out specific goals, and some included like attending my sister's graduation at Allegheny College in Pennsylvania. I mean, it was great that he got to do that. And then he made a conscious effort to go to the beach with us the last year, which was important. And then the most important ones to me was he told us that he would make every single football game. And yeah, I mean, that, that was, that kind of just like got me through a lot. Cause like I could always count on him being there each week. Even my brother's all-star game at the end of the year when it was like 30 degrees snowing, he was there. And I remember him saying he was, I did it. And I was like, yeah, I, I couldn't believe it. And like I was, and, and not just us, like the whole community like saw this and wow, he didn't miss a game. That was just like, he cared that much. And it, that was like really special for me. 
Karen Jones also wants to get the most from her remaining days. But she still wonders if she should continue to seek a cure. During his visit, hospice doctor Hank Wilner addresses the issue. I was thinking about your questions about whether to continue or try to discover other ways to affect your cancer. Okay, I would be interested. And um, I still came back to thinking that I hope you preserve the quality of life you have. Yes. And that you not disrupt it unless you're convinced that there is something out there that will provide you uh, with a, a high chance of benefit mm -hmm. and very low burden. Yes. Okay? Because your, your quality of life is really pretty high. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we love seeing that. That's our hope for you. And that's our goal. And we hate to see anything disrupted. So, <laughs> for clinical trials, I'm doing so well that I'm hesitant to do one without Dr. Wilner's blessing because, you know, it could really damage me. I've seen it where it could be the opposite. You get some side effect. You read the side effects. Very possible. It could be the end, and not helpful. I may ask them, um, would you prefer to live shorter time, more comfortably? Or would you risk uh, abandoning the comfort in the hopes of living longer? You know, and that decision would be very hard to make because you want something to give you a full cure. I, I just don't know if uh, I'll ever get that. So I will come back to see you in about a month. Yep. Some people do leave hospice to receive additional treatment for their symptoms. Verna Can lives with her daughter, Linda Gorham. Verna's a creative woman. She makes quilts, works with clay, paints, draws, including the illustrations for a children's book written by her granddaughter. She's even shot and edited her own documentaries. Now 80, she suffers from congestive heart failure. They told my daughter that I had six months to live. It could be three months, could be six months, it could, you know, and her voice kind of trailed off. So I, I knew then it was serious. So I came home and got ready to curl up in the bed, draw up my feet in, in my fetal position and die. The doctor was extremely concerned. Mom's condition had worsened to the point that she was going to recommend hospice. So Verna entered hospice one year ago. I know I'm going to die, I said to myself. I don't have to do it right this minute. Over the course of that year, though, she's left hospice twice. When the nurse came, she examined my mother and said, you know, she is really sick and um, she's having a lot of difficulty breathing. I asked the nurse about a couple of procedures that I thought would help her. Um, she said that, that they were limited in what they could do, but if I felt that I wanted those procedures, she would um, recommend that I withdraw from hospice and have her transported to the hospital. And she actually um, had some papers with her. We did it right then. She also helped me get my mother in the car and um, I took her to the hospital. While she was there um, with the treatment that she received, her suffering was alleviated and her condition improved dramatically. And all of a sudden, the people give me the medicine, and I started living. I celebrated my 80th birthday in the hospital. When she finished her treatment, Verna was eligible to return to hospice. She was readmitted and given additional support when she came home. And that made a big difference in her quality of life. Now she's leaving hospice again, not because she's in need of emergency care, but because she's been too healthy. My mother was on hospice care for a year, and we received notice um, this week, actually, that her condition was stable and that she was no longer um, a candidate or no longer needing hospice services. They're saying, I don't need it. Uh, I'm, I've been consistent. 
through the six months that they didn't look for me to live. So now that with this consistency has called caused me to be kicked out. I can't be the little diva I was trying to be, but it's okay. It's okay. And the reason why it's okay, because that's a good sign. What's more, Verna and her daughter know that if Verna's health declines, she can always re-enter hospice. My understanding is that hospice is available to us um, if her condition changes. And because we know that there's no cure for heart failure, that it's very likely um, that um, we may need the services again. At this point, I don't feel like it's a lost cause because they tell me, you can come back, and that's so nice to know. And joining me now is Dr. Terry Melvin, Chief Medical Officer of the Hospice of Chattanooga in Tennessee. Three really remarkable stories again. And you know, you can't say enough how grateful we should be to these people for letting us into their lives, these very personal parts of their lives. But let's talk about Verna May for a moment. Mm -hmm. She gets better. She's discharged from hospice. She goes and gets treatment. She comes back in hospice. Then she's discharged because she's too healthy. How do hospices decide whether a patient should be discharged or not? In this particular case, the treatments that she needed to help with her symptoms was outside of the realm of coverage for that particular hospice. So she did leave, they treated her symptoms, and then she returned. Prognosticating how long someone has is not easy. Right. Are you allowed to receive curative uh, treatment while in hospice? Not curative treatment. So if you're getting a treatment like that, then you would uh, exit hospice for that treatment. What about in the case of a cancer patient, for example, mm -hmm. chemo? Mm -hmm. So if the chemo is for cure, then the patient is discharged from the hospice program. But if it's radiation therapy to treat maybe a bone metastasis, a bone lesion, mm -hmm. to help with pain control, then you don't have to be discharged from the hospice and how program. About, how about non-curative treatments, transfusions, IV fluids? The question is, what's the goal? What is that patient's goal? If that patient's goal is to be as comfortable as they can be and their blood counts are low, um, giving them a little bit of blood's not going to hurt anything. If they get dehydrated and they have a goal to achieve a graduation or a wedding or be around for somebody's birthday, a little bit of fluids don't hurt anything. Um, chemotherapy, on the other ha hand, if the chemotherapy is for cure, they will be coming off of hospice. Let me ask you one more um, sort of in the weeds question about treatment with patients who are in hospice. Uh -huh. If you're in hospice for, say, your cancer, your, your terminal cancer, okay. but you have medical issues that are not related to that cancer, uh -huh. is that treated within this context of hospice and how? It's so much more complicated than just that terminal cancer because that cancer impacts that whole body. So then that body gets fatigued. Then that body has pain. So then I give pain medicine to the body. So now my body gets a little constipated. Now I get a little bit nauseated. So now I have an infection because my immune system is down. And so we treat the whole system. Another theme is pain. Yes. And hospice is very engaged in helping to manage pain. How do you deal with people? What do you say to people who are worried that the pain management will make them less present? Mm -hmm. The goal is not to have them less present. The goal is for them to be engaged. The goal is so that they have relief um, and still be able to do those things that they want to do. The question is, is it comfortable to them and can they provide their their day-to-day -day activities. So you say we can balance this? We balance it. We do balance it. I think, Dr. Melvin, this is a very important point and I want to highlight that, this, that you've just made. Hospice care is about managing a whole body of care around a person who has a limited time left because of their illness. That's absolutely correct. And the intriguing part of this is when you say a limited time, we don't know what that limited time is. Because sometimes it's a few days, and sometimes in Verna's case, she, 
outlived the expectation. She's doing well, and she graduates. Dr. Terry Melvin, thanks. Appreciate oh, it. Thank you. Great insight. We've been talking about how hospice addresses the patient's medical needs, their physical pain and symptoms, but many people are surprised to learn that hospice can provide spiritual support as well. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, thanks for coming. It's great you are able to make it. I know. Karen Jones is Catholic, and since her illness began, she's received spiritual support from her local priest, Father Paris. We'll start, we'll do Holy Communion. Yeah, that'd be great. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Though Karen relies on her own priest, hospice also provides spiritual support for those who request it. Mickey Fox is in hospice at home, where she lives with one of her daughters, Claudia. Mickey's husband passed away more than 20 years ago. She suffers from a heart condition. I have this aortal valve that needs to be replaced, and I chose not to have the open heart surgery because of the risk. Mickey could have joined a clinical trial for a new catheterization procedure to fix the valve. Good. But when I discovered the risk, it turned out that there were more risks of that than the open heart. And at my age, I'm 90 now, and I've had a great life, and I didn't want to wind up with a stroke. So I said, well, I prayed about it. I spoke to the priest of my church, and I felt that I had a clear message from the Lord to let nature take its course. So that's where I am now, and I'm very comfortable with it. Knock, knock. Hello, Mrs. Fox. Oh, hi, Susan. Hi, Mrs. Religion Fox. How are you is important doing today? to Mickey, and yeah, in addition to support from her you. church, she receives visits from a hospice chaplain, Susan Mitchell. So, what's been on your mind these days? Well, I've been thinking how um, much you helped to pull me through the hard times, oh. and now I'm just kind of going with the flow and mm -hmm. uh, enjoying life and planning ahead. I was very anxious, and but I think through your helping me, teaching me how to meditate, that was great. Mm. So have you been doing that, like at night before you go mm -hmm. to bed? Or? I do. I define spirituality, and the hospice community defines it very broadly as um, a relationship um, to someone or something greater than yourself, um, a sense of belonging, a sense of transcendence, a sense that there's something more. You know, we don't specify what that something more is. It can be religion. Mrs. Fox is very religious, and so she has that vocabulary. Has your prayer changed as you had gone through this experience the last prayer, several months? Well, I think, you know, I had a sort of a routine way of praying so that mm. I sort of covered all the bases. Yeah. And so we offer, um, first and foremost, a listening presence. Uh, as a chaplain, I don't judge anyone. I meet someone where they are. No chaplain will proselytize or try to convert you or save you or change your beliefs. We are there for you. So what I tried to do is kind of gently guide them to coming to their own answers. It's not important what I believe. It's important what they believe and what they need at the end of life. <laughs> Dr. Herbert Netchen is another hospice patient who enjoys visits from a hospice chaplain. But unlike Mickey Fox, Dr. Netchen is Jewish, and he's not religious. Not all people who are spiritual uh, are religious. Um, I do not find for myself that religion helps me. But I do admire those who are able to think that way. Uh, it gives them comfort. It does not comfort me. Despite that, Dr. Netchen values the time he spends with hospice chaplain Avis Hoyt O'Connor. Uh, I enjoy talking to her. Uh, in fact, um, I didn't know she was a chaplain. Uh, I saw the, the, the title, uh, but I had not at all uh, concentrated upon it. Uh, I viewed her as a person, and we talk about many, many things. And I think that is uh, what I find helpful. So for me, spirituality is all those things that... Uh, we, we talk. Uh, we can talk about how I feel and uh, about what I've done and some of the things uh, that are going on at the present time, uh, all of which I think are part of uh, spirituality. 
Gary Fink is Vice President of Spiritual Care and Volunteer Services at Montgomery Hospice in Rockville, Maryland. He's also a rabbi. Welcome, Rabbi Fink. Thank you, Frank. Well, this is so interesting and such an important part of the journey, spirituality, religiousness. Do you have to be religious to receive or benefit from hospice care? When I see a patient or a family, my first question is not going to be, do you believe in God? <laughs> but early on our conversation, I may ask, what is meaningful to you? What brings meaning to your life at this particular time? And what do they say? For some people, it is all about a relationship with God. For other people, it's about a relationship with family members, with husband, wife, with friends, or a relationship with family members who are long gone. Do you have to ask hospice for this spiritual support, or does it come in the door with the team? Spiritual support is always offered as part of the hospice program, and chaplains or spiritual counselors are always available uh, as, as part of that team. A family member, a patient may decline spiritual care. Others may welcome a chaplain just to have someone to talk to, someone who is non-judgmental, someone to help an individual frame and make sense of what's going on. If you are sitting with a patient and, you, and they reach out to you and they say, tell me what my life has meant. I, 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 here I am at the end. It went by in a flash. What do you tell them? Sometimes a question is not an invitation for an answer, but is an invitation for a conversation. So my response is to expand the conversation. Tell me about your life. Where did you grow up? Tell me about your parents, what has been meaningful to you, your challenges, what are you proud of, what regrets do you have? Sometimes life review can be a, a very profound spiritual activity because it helps an individual sort out what is meaningful to give them comfort as they look back on their life as they're moving towards the end of their life. Life review, great, great term. What kinds of things do patients think about or think about accomplishing or doing in their time remaining? Do they talk to you about that? Is that a big part of the spiritual conversation? Sometimes there is unfinished business. It could be very simple. It could be very profound. Uh, sometimes it is as simple as one last visit to the local baseball stadium. We had a patient uh, for whom we at Montgomery Hospice arranged oxygen and wheelchair and transportation for one last visit to the local ballpark. And that was his spiritual fulfillment at the end of his life. For others, it involves that which has been unsaid, saying to loved ones, I love you, I forgive you, reviewing with loved ones that which had never been articulated. We are such a diverse culture. How does hospice handle this vast diversity of religiosity, belief, and spirituality? Part of that, I think, comes from the training that hospice chaplains receive, training in broad cultural competencies. What do other faiths do? Sometimes that means calling in the local pastor or monk or imam or bringing in resources from the outside, as long as we can find someone else or another source to provide that comfort. Rabbi Gary Fink, thank you so much. Appreciate it. We've been talking about how hospice can help someone approaching the end of life, but many people may not be aware that hospice also provides support for family members and other caregivers after their loved ones have passed away. We spoke to Nancy Smith about her experience. Michael Smith passed away in late March of 2012 at age 51 after his long struggle with cancer. His wife, Nancy, remembers her first reaction. I'll tell you, it had been so bad and um, that it was a huge relief. It, the relief lasted a long time to the extent that um, we got used to saying to people, comforting others you know what I'd say is um, anybody who lived in this house can be nothing but grateful it's over so for a long time I think we were all in this position of making other people feel better about this 
that relief got us through a long time. Nancy was also busy. There was the funeral, then senior prom and high school graduation, getting the twins ready to go off to college. When the hospice social worker first called to offer help, Nancy declined. She didn't have time to grieve. At some point in the spring, I got a call from Franz Moore at hospice about this is a service we provide and, you know, when you're ready. And when all of that dust settled and I finally had time to kind of think about me, I finally also started with the bereavement support uh, from hospice. She called as soon as the boys left for school and became an empty nester, which was another loss. And we began some individual counseling at that time. I just felt, you know, um, this opportunity has been given to me. I'd never gone to counseling before. I didn't know anything about it. And um, I started one-on-one -on -one with Fran. Many people don't uh, really fully start feeling their feelings until several months have passed. And that's when it gets really painful and difficult. And they could use the extra support and they seek it out then. It was very helpful to have somebody come at this in terms of here's where you are, you know, and um, you people have the capacity to stay there or wallow or move up. And, you know, to have somebody say to me, I think you're a person who could move up, you know, gain something from this and give back um, was very helpful to me and very affirming, you know. I'm very clear that I'm not going to fix this. I'm not going to make the person come back. I don't have magic potions to provide. It was very helpful in kind of saying, you know, I'm going to get my life back in order and look at things as me, not as the wife of Michael. It's very different. What I can do is be a really good listener and offer some suggestions as to things that they can do, that any bereaved person can do, to try to get through the process. And so um, I really enjoyed my time with her, and she pushed me very hard to get into a grief support group. And I was not as gung-ho about that. She was really, um, as I recall, kind of reluctant to participate in our bereavement support group. And I thought that it would be a nice next step for her. And, and she did. It, you have a common ground in, in losing a spouse. Um, somebody was talking about, you know, what do you do on the first anniversary of their death? How am I going to go to this wedding I was invited to by myself? Things that seem obvious, but they're, they're not. It was very beneficial. Fran was right. And joining me now is Dr. Kenneth Doka, professor of gerontology at the Graduate School of the College of New Rochelle and senior consultant to the Hospice Foundation of America. Dr. Doka is also a Lutheran minister as well as an author, editor, and expert on grief and grieving. Ken, good to see you. Good to see you again, Frank. It is striking watching Nancy's story. She talks about a huge relief. She talks about how grateful everyone was that was that it was all over, but even now she's overcome with emotion as she even speaks about that. Yeah. You know, I think one of the things we sometimes do is we associate grief with sadness, with loneliness, with yearning. And in reality, um, grief is any reaction we have to the loss. And it's not unusual after a long experience of caregiving that the first reaction one might have is, thank God it's over. Um, and then the person may have, over time, a series of other reactions. Do you find that caregivers often forget to or don't have time for or the luxury of taking care of themselves? Oh, that's often a major issue with caregivers, that, um, that it becomes so absorbing uh, as a matter of fact, there's even a study that says um, that caregivers have sometimes a, um, a much higher mortality rate because they don't take care of themselves. While they're in the caregiving well, process? While they're in the caregiving process. Wow. So what is hospice's role in that? Well, I think hospice's role is, is twofold. One is um, obviously by the services they provide, by the emotional support they provide during the course of the illness to provide some respite to the caregiver uh, and, and certainly to emphasize the need to self-care. But after that, and this is, I think, um, 
an often um, unrealized benefit to the general public about hospice. They provide bereavement services, usually for at least a year, much like Nancy had it. I loved the moment in the video where Nancy said, referring to her grief counseling, this person said, you're a person who can move up. And I watched you watching that and you nodded your head. You know, I, I think uh, some people you know, they're really diminished by the death and they, and they never find life meaningful or as meaningful again. But other people find uh, what some people have called post-traumatic growth. Mm. They find new strengths, new abilities, uh, new insights, deeper spirituality. And the support that hospice can provide can often help people find those, those strengths and, and grow up in grief. And when should people seek support? Well, I think the question is, is if you, if you feel you need support, if you feel you're not getting support, reach out to it. And, and I think, you know, Nancy's a good example there. She probably had, when, her, when the twins were there, they probably were a good support system well, they for her. they kept her busy. They kept her busy. They kept her involved. She could probably talk about her husband with them. They could probably reminisce. Once they were gone, she needed help. This notion of she didn't have time to grieve. Do you find that is, is also a common experience? You know, what we find in, in most people is that they're doing a little bit better um, right after the loss. And then there's a, I always describe grief as a kind of roller coaster. So, you know, when you get on the roller coaster, at first it's not so bad. And then you hit that first decline because you're, you know, you're, you have to plan the funeral. You have to send thank you cards. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. You're still in shock. And you're surrounded by people. And you're surrounded by people. And then, you know, I always remember one widow who said, the first time um, I began to grieve was when I went to my mailbox and there wasn't a sympathy card. And I went to my answering machine and there wasn't a sympathy message. And I said, now I realize I'm alone. Finally, this, Ken, what kind of conversation should people have with themselves or with their loved ones before they're in hospice about this kind of thing? Probably my answer would be is the best conversations to have are the conversations that finish business. Um, you know, I've seen more people come in grief counseling saying, I never told him I loved him. I never told her I loved her. Um, you know, so say what you need to say when you need to say it. Well, Ken Doka, thank you so much for sharing your your insight and your wisdom on this. Thank you very much, Frank. Thank you. In addition to grief counseling, hospice can help people prepare for the death of a loved one in a number of ways. Let's meet a couple now trying to prepare for an unknown future. Hello. Hi. 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 At their apartment in a retirement community, Leon Schwartz and his wife, Jean, enjoy a visit from their daughter and granddaughter. Hi. Hi, how are you? Leon's oh, had a full you. life. Navigator on a B-17 bomber during World War II, college professor, and writer. He first met Jean in 1948. I saw Jean, and it was lightning. <laughs> I couldn't take my eyes off her. We got married the following March, and... Uh, we went on a wonderful honeymoon. Hi, Dad. Okay. How are you today? I'm all right. Leon suffered the first of five heart attacks at age 41. After the third, a defibrillator was implanted in his chest. But Leon's experience during his last heart attack led him to a decision. I was on a defibrillator, and I had a shock. So I went to the hospital. And while I was in the hospital, this was last August, a year ago, I got 13 shocks in a row. The one with the 13 shocks was the worst in my life. I've never seen anything like it. It was like somebody who had a seizure. I was yelling to kill me. He just said, kill me, kill me, I want to die. And it, this was the worst thing for me to hear from him. Leon decided to have the defibrillator removed. And his doctor told him, if you want to take the defibrillator, if you get a ventricular tachycardia, you know you are gone. And he said, it's OK. And I decided I felt the same way. My feeling is that I'm going to be 91 in a couple of weeks. 
and you don't live forever. And I've had a good life. Family to be here. Okay. Hospice social worker Ann Johnson has been meeting with Leon's wife, Jean, to help her prepare for the day that will inevitably come. Well, that's good to know. But do you know what to do if he passes here? If he passes away, mm -hmm. I just call the hospice. Is that it? Right. On the yellow card. On the yellow card, I just call. And the other one that will come to the apartment. Right. With hospice, the family makes one call. There are no fire trucks or police or ambulances. In my experience, that's what the families want. That's usually the, how they phrase it, that we want it to be peaceful and quiet. Um, and with hospice, it is. Anne has provided much support for Leon and Jean. Now she wants to look ahead to help Jean prepare for life without her husband. You've been dealing with this for a long time, for like over 50 years. That's right. How do you envision your life to be when he's not here anymore? I certainly will miss him very, mm -hmm. very much because he was a, not only a husband, but he was also a friend and a, and a lover. Mm -hmm. How many years have you guys been married? 64 years. Wow. 64 years. That's a long time. Yes. You know, even though you know that this is going to happen and you've kind of been preparing for it, when it should happen, you might think that you're going to react in one way where you might totally react in a different way. However you feel, you just need to let it flow and, and feel it. And that we'll be here also to support you. Yes, I know that. OK. OK. Thank you. I'd like to welcome back Samara Beckwith, President and CEO of Hope Healthcare Services serving Southwest Florida. That was quite a conversation we just heard. It was. Extraordinary, all in a day's work. Well, it certainly is part of the planning process and part of the work that does need to take place for the person and for the family. What kind of supportive services can families expect to receive in situations like this from, from hospice? What the social worker will be there to provide the planning and to help with some of the choices that will have to be made that people don't think about ahead of time because you know, they've been married, they know how they've been functioning all that period of time, and now there's new roles and responsibilities. And so having someone to talk those through with is very, very important. And in this particular situation, the social worker is available for all of the hospice patients and families to help with that planning. And do you find that when people have conversations about when someone, presumably in the next room, passes away, there won't be an ambulance, here's the number to call, it's kind of nitty gritty stuff. Do people, are they very uncomfortable with that? Or is that the kind of information at this point they actually want to have? we actually find that people are relieved. Really? Because, yes, because even though they've not asked, they're worrying about it inside. And it's the unasked question. And I really appreciated the way the social worker went over in detail. Because whenever we're under a stressful situation, then it's really hard to remember what to do. So we have to make it very simple and go over it a couple of times. What are the kinds of issues and decisions then like that? that uh, hospice team members help patients and families confront and decide? If we can, yeah. and when we can, we really want to help them think about funeral arrangements, memorial services, what kind of documents they're going to need at the time. Because as we heard in the film, sometimes we think we're going to react one way, and when the time comes, we react differently. And so that reaction might be to be a little confused, not remember where we put something. And so to try to plan ahead of time as much as possible is very helpful. And you hear a lot of patients, I've heard them say, you know, here's the kind of memorial I want. I don't want a funeral. I want to celebrate. I want this kind of music. I want that. You know, they, they want to be involved in that conversation. It's very healing for them to be able to have that conversation and to be able to know that their wishes are going to be respected and to be involved. So it is very important to give the person that opportunity. Samara Beckwith, thank you so much for all your insight here today and for all that you and all your colleagues in hospice do every day. Well, you are so welcome, and we are all honored to do this work. And we are all better for it. We have heard some moving stories here, stories that inform us, stories that inspire us, stories that help us understand how important it is to plan and how empowering it is to know the facts. 
At the beginning of this program, we said the word hospice can evoke fear or comfort. I hope we've provided some insight on the options and services that are available. For more information about hospice, please visit the Hospice Foundation of America website at hospicefoundation.org. And as a final note, we'd like to offer a special thanks to the participants who so graciously allowed us into their homes and lives in such a personal and selfless way. I'm Frank Sesno. Thanks very much for joining us. There's not a day that goes by that I don't thank God because I've had these great experiences with my wife and with my kids. I mean, that's possible because hospice has been here. It's possible because of the great support we've received from hospice. But it's incredible that in this terrible, terrible situation, there is so much joy and love and happiness and hope. I mean, who would think it? This program was presented by the Hospice Foundation of America and underwritten by the John and Juana Harmon Foundation.